That's only if you're able. We're going to be reading out of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I have a second son that Eric has five children. My second son has four, and my baby daughter has five. So I've got 14 grandchildren. And uh, <clears throat> when they were playing that old win, the saints go marching in. You won't believe how Eric over there, Professor Eric, can play a banjo. I'm telling you what. I thought if he had that banjo here, he could fly on that thing. But we're so thankful because all of our family are saved and working in the ministry. I've been, this year is 52 years of ministry that I've been in the ministry, and I've been pastoring my home church that I've been born and raised in for 43 years. And so we're just giving God thanks. We're going to be reading in Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. And by the way, I am married <laughs> for 45 years. She's a, prince, she's a principal of a school. <laughs> and uh, anyway, she keeps me ironed up, cleaned up, and that's why I'm here. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Just for a few moments tonight, we're dealing with the subject, it's your turn to run. Let's say that together. It's your turn to run. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Let this word be preached with love, with mercy, with compassion. And as you teach me in the scripture with demonstration and power of the Holy Ghost, and I will give you the praise and the glory in the mighty, wonderful name of Jesus. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Just for a few moments tonight, we're dealing with the subject, it's your turn to run. And I would like to say, last night's message was dynamic. The way Brother Gabriel brought forth the word. This morning's message was dynamic, uh, and it was wonderful. And then... Uh, Dr. DePew, I wasn't in here. He gave me an excuse, but he discussed it with me before he got out of here, before he delivered it, because he talked about Kentucky, the Cane Ridge Revival, and I'm sure he said a lot of good things about Kentucky. Did he? Thank you, Dr. DePew. Just for a few moments tonight, we're dealing with the subject, it's your turn to run. Let's say it one more time. It's your turn to run. You know, God has started using me in dreams. You can call them night visions. The first one was at my great-grandmother's house. Her mother, my great-great-grandmother, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in 1906 in the pea patch picking peas in the mountains of eastern Kentucky, in the coal mining camps. And my great-grandmother was getting sick, ill, and um, mom had taken us up there, and we were sleeping. It was a very poor home with an outhouse in the back. Uh, you had to go get water out of the well. They didn't have doors. They had curtains that they had pinned up. They didn't have enough money for doors. We were sleeping in an old bed. This is the very first night vision I ever experienced. And it was the old, you know, the old springs, and that thing all night long was singing. <laughs> and then uh, I had a night vision, a dream. My great-grandmother was going through a long row. It was a big field of, big field of corn. She was picking that corn so fast and filling it up in a big basket. And 
I never seen anybody pull corn off the ear, off the stalk that fast. And she disappears. I'm only about maybe six years old. The corn keeps on falling in the basket. And a voice speaks so loud it wakes me up. And the voice said, will you work in the harvest? And I sat up in the bed, and I, that was my first encounter I'd had with that kind of experience. A few years ago, I, and I've had many of these night visions, I've had people talk to me that I've never met before. I've had people in the church tell me of conditions they had. I'm not trying to play spooky on you. I'm just telling you I can't help it. I doubt myself most of the time. I'm my worst enemy. I, I don't like to hear people say the Lord said this and the Lord said that because I'm. Not, I think they got to be careful. When you said the Lord said it, He better said it. And and He He don't you don't make stuff up that He didn't say. That's not good for anybody to do. And so I've always doubted myself. And, uh, but when I'm in a sound sleep, I can't doubt it. And I've had people appear to me in these night dreams and tell me they had conditions in their body. And I'd go to church the next day. I said, you appeared to me. Is this real? And it was real. This particular night vision, maybe about 15, 20 years ago, the Spirit of God took me in a, into the first century, the time of the writing of the apostles in the Word of God. And he took me into an Olympic, an Olympic event. Now, I didn't know about this Olympic event. After the dream was over, I had to look it up to make sure it wasn't some type of a crazy dream. You know, I want to see if this thing is accurate at all. And in this dream, I saw a uh, young man dressed in just like a loincloth, no shoes, no shirt, and it was an Olympic relay race. He bowed down and they lit this torch and he took off running down those Roman roads. He ran until the hot sun was beating on his brow. I watched his lips crack under the, they were parched because of the sun and the lack of hydration. I saw him run on those cobblestones until his feet began to bleed. And then I saw him run, and I thought the man is surely going to collapse. But while he was running, he comes, and there was another runner who knew he was next. And he was stand on his knee waiting for that torch to touch his torch. And when the torch touched his torch, he kept on running. This went on runner after runner after runner until there was a final runner. When the final runner came... He knew it was his. He knew he was the last one. I didn't know what he was going to be coming to. I had no idea the dream was going on. But you could see the excitement, the anticipation. I'm the last runner. It's my turn to run. And when he got to the end of his race, he ran, and there was an archway. And I've been to, I was in nine different countries before I was 20. I was in Israel in 1972, in Greece, and in and in France, and Lebanon, and Syria. And when he got to the finish line, he had to go through this beautiful, huge stone arch. There was a Colosseum with multiplied thousands in that Colosseum. There was music that was playing. And while he was running on the last stretch, he could hear that music. He could hear the applause. He could see that archway. Even though his lips were parched, even though his brow was sun-beaten, even though the blood was coming off of his feet, his heart was pounding. I'm the last runner. And he ran. As soon as he went through that arch, a loud voice spoke and said, Seeing you are encompassed about with such great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin. Let us run with patience this race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus Christ, I heard the voice loud, but I didn't wake up 
to the voice said, it's your turn to run. And I would like to let you know tonight that the torch was given to this triumphant church on the day of Pentecost when God the Spirit arrived and there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing and a mighty wind that filled the house where they were sitting. Cloven tongues of fire sent on each one of them. They began to take this gospel on the Roman roads. Thomas went all the way to India to the state of Kerala. It was there he was speared to a pagan altar, but he carried that gospel to the Keralites there in India. Those Roman roads went to Spain. They went to Morocco. They went to all of the known part of the world. They went all the way to Britain. And there in Great Britain, I know this is the month of St. Patrick's Day, and we were holiness people. We never celebrated anything that was connected to Catholicism. Sorry, but we just didn't. We didn't celebrate four-leaf clovers and leprechauns or anything like that. But in my studies one time, I found out that St. Patrick was from the holiness way. <laughs> and he's one of those that received the message of Jesus Christ. He was one that received it in Britain. He was captured by the Irish. The Irish were known to be pagan people. They had many gods. They had many sorceries and things of that sort. He was in prison, but escaped, made his way back to London. He was just a young man. And when he got to London, he told his parents, how can I enjoy life knowing that the Irish have no God that we know? They do not know God came to this earth, Jesus Christ, and died on the cross that they might have an abundant life. Patrick went back to Ireland knowing he should have been murdered but when he got there, it so gripped the hearts of the Irish. Why are you here? He said, I'm here because you will perish unless you know about the great God who visited this earth. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Patrick built over 400 churches. Ireland was turned upside down in the year three, in the 300s and the 400s. The Roman Catholic Church did not arrive until the 700s, and that's when they made him a saint. And I want you to know he's St. Patrick to the Catholic, but he's from the Bible way to the evangelical because he received this on the Roman road. The Roman road, they turned the world upside down in less than 30 years. But then by the time you get to 312, they had even conquered the Roman Empire. They had conquered the entire Roman Empire. Mark chapter 4, verse 26 through 30, said the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that sows seed into the ground. And he goes to sleep and he wakes up. And he goes to sleep and he wakes up. And he goes to sleep and he wakes up. And while he's sleeping and while he's waking, First comes the blade, then it gets a little higher. It becomes a stalk, then comes the ear, then comes the full kernel of ear, and he don't even know how it happened. He's letting us know what happened in those years of time, the years of time when the world through Christianity was having sleepy spells and then great awakenings. So from the time of the church being planted, it went through series and series of awakening and sleeping. It woke up with the Waldenses. It woke up with the Albigenses in the 1200s. Woke up with the Lollards. Woke up with the Huguenots or Huguenot, however you would say it. Woke up with the Anabaptist. Woke up with the Amish. Woke up with the Mennonites. But in Mark chapter 4, it says that it goes to sleep and he wakes up until the time of the harvest. And when it's time of the harvest, there is no more time for sleeping. There is no more time because the harvest is upon us. Where are we in time tonight? There are two 
undeniable signs of the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the harvest time. The first one is the country of Israel. Jesus said not one stone of this temple will be left upon another. In 70 AD, the Jews were dispersed all over the known world and they stayed dispersed until 1900. The movement of Zionism brought the Jews in wagons with donkeys back to Palestine as it was called. 1917, Great Britain signed the Balfour Declaration declaring a national home for the Jews. 1948, the Israeli flag began to fly and was recognized, Israel was recognized as a nation. 1967, the Six-Day War was fought and Israel, Jerusalem, was now given back to the hands of the Jewish people. 1973, the War of Yom Kippur returned all of the Golan Heights back to the land of Israel. Last year, and even into this year, we have seen another war that is 50 years after the War of Yom Kippur. Everything that's happening right now in the Middle East and Israel is your alarm clock. And your alarm clock is getting closer to the midnight hour than it has ever been. That is the first undeniable sign. You can't deny it. You cannot deny what I have just told you. But there is a second undeniable sign. The prophet Joel, 700 years before the birth of Christ, he said, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your men in authority going to dream a dream. Your young men are going to burn with fire of a, with a vision. Out of my spirit, I'm going to pour on the women and you won't be able to hush them for anything. <laughs> women, that was your clue right there. According to sociology, men have 10,000 words a day. And when a man says hallelujah, he just says one hallelujah. But a woman, according to sociology, has 40,000 words a day. So when a man says hallelujah, a woman says hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. When a man puts his foot down and says, Satan, you won't have my family. A woman says, you ain't going to have my family. You're going to have my husband. not going to have my city. I'm telling you, women, you're the secret weapon. This is your time to shout right now. Never in history. He said, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit on the women. I'm going to pour to bring out the secret weapon because life and death are in the power of the tongue and I'm going to cause these women to open up their mouth and say you're not having my body you're not having my church you're not having my children you're not having my family you're not having my community and you're not going to have my nation give the Lord a shout of praise hallelujah now I know there's somebody right now wanting to argue with me we're not going to argue because I'm the one that's preaching right now. But somebody right now would want to argue. They say, oh, yeah, that's true. That was fulfilled because Simon Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost. He said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, I'll, it was already, it's already been fulfilled. It's all over with. But the pastor of the Jerusalem church, because everybody was getting a little uptight, they were preaching Maranatha, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming. They said, he's not coming yet. He hasn't come yet. So the Spirit of God moved up on James, the pastor of the Jerusalem church. He said, brother, let me tell you something. Be patient unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the husband and God the Father waiteth long for the precious fruit of the earth. And he has patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. There's going to be two showers of the same stuff. One rain coming in two seasons. The first season was a time of planting. They came out of that upper room to plant the church. But this last outpouring 
is to bring in the harvest. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. I do not believe we have seen the peak of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. They thought we saw it in the 20s. Some people in our church thought it was in the 30s. There are those in my parents' day thought it was in the 50s. My day was 70s and 80s. We thought, sure, that's about as good as it's going to get. But I'm telling you what, I don't think we have seen what Joel said is going to happen. And here's my reason why, Brother Gabe, you preached so good last night. And the reason why is this. If it's going to be a duplication of what already has been and has been documented in the book of Acts to let you know what the outpouring is, in case you don't know, it's already been documented. It's not my opinion. It's the opinion of the book. But at the peak, men cried out, what must I do to be saved? We have not seen that manifestation yet. People are looking for an outpouring to shake a little more, and I'm all about shaking. They're looking for an outpouring to see another, I don't know what all they see, gold and feathers and, and everything else. They're looking for some more manifestation. But the number one manifestation that the fullness of the Spirit has come in power is when conviction falls and men and women cry. What must I do to be saved? Look up, child of God. That has not happened yet. And it's getting ready to happen. And I pray to God that this Sunlight Broadcasting Network is going to be one of the key ones that's going to look in that camera and hundreds of thousands in Middle Eastern countries, in Asian countries, in African countries, in European countries are going to realize there is something bigger than they are. There is something greater than they have. It is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not by might, and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. I refuse to sit around and say it's over with, that we're in the great falling away. That's what they preached in the 1960s. That's what they were preaching, the great falling away, and especially in the holiness churches. They, they said it's getting so worldly. Men are buying white belts. <laughs> it's true. They preached at our youth camp against men using hair dryers, and that's when the 70s, the dry look was in. You've never seen so many young men squirming in their seats. <laughs> they said it's getting so worldly. Men are winner, men are are buying white belts, and they always got to put a hack on it. Men are why buying white belts. Ha! And <laughs> let's go on. <laughs> but have I given you enough evidence to know that we're at the brink of something? Let us not sleep as do others, but let us be sober. Hallelujah. We are on the brink of the greatest revival. I'm, uh, I'm believing for it in Jesus' name. I said I'm believing. So we are in harvest time. Say harvest time. This is not time for sleeping. It's not time for slumbering. It is time to open up the door of the ark, the one door, Jesus Christ, and bring them in. So when you get to the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth is a book of the harvest. It's a book that the Jewish people read every day of Pentecost, the book of Ruth. It's about a Gentile bride who is going to marry the Lord of the harvest, but she don't know how to get the job done. So she's got Naomi. Naomi is the only word there is. She is the word of God giving Ruth instruction. And Naomi comes and she says in Ruth chapter 3, verse 3, Oh, Ruth, oh, Ruth. Honey, if you're going to get married, first thing you're going to have to do is wash yourself. You're going to have to wash yourself. And someone would say, why do we have to hear such preaching? Because the Bible said he's coming after a church. Yeah. 
without spot and without wrinkle, prepared as a bride for her husband. And this church is going to be washed. We know we're saved by the blood, but he wants to clean us up real good for the wedding. It's going to be washed with the washing of water by the word of God. And I love it what Brother Gabe said last night. He said it all begins with preaching. And in the word of God, this is the way, this is the form. How many wants to know how to have a revival? Come on, talk to me. You want to know how to have a revival? It's in the Bible. First of all, it comes by the anointed preaching. An anointed preaching of the word of God will always cause the hearer if it's under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it will draw the people to prayer. That's number two. Number three, prayer produces holiness. Holiness isn't a list of things that I give you. If it don't come out of here, you don't have it at all. Holiness is only produced by prayer. Holiness has preceded every revival. You look up your history. You look up everything about revivals. There's always been somebody who heard a message, who took the message to prayer. Prayer produced a holiness, a fear of God, and it's preceded every revival. True revival is not how much we roll, not how much we jump. We may do that when people get saved, but that's not what true revival is. True revival is when the center, the sinner comes to repentance and the alcohol falls off the alcoholic and the drugs fall off of the drug addict. That is what true revival is. True revival brings in the harvest. He said, Naomi said, Ruth, you're gonna have to wash yourself. This is why we need to have the preaching of the word. The preaching of the word to keep us in line with the word of God. But he said, number two, Naomi said, Ruth, anoint yourself. My goodness, in the United States of America, we've already come through that season. Everywhere in a season, people standing in line, waiting to get somebody else's anointing, waiting for somebody to blow on you, spit on you, throw their coat on you, throw water on you. Whatever they got to throw on you, throw on you. Waiting in line. The American people have fallen in the floor till the back of their head is flatter than a two by four. And they got up the same way they went down. You hear me? I cannot play a game with you and tell you if you just write that check out. Oh, right now, for $1,000, lay it right here at my feet. You're going to get my anointing, and you're going to be able to be in this nation and that nation. Just write this check out. We've heard that stuff. I've been in meetings before. They said, if you'll just write a check for $1,000, I know you're living in the projects. Borrow it from somebody. But if you'll write that check out, then you're going to own the projects next year. And I'm going, what? Own the projects? I've never seen anybody get rich you want to go buy the projects uh, do you hear what I'm saying there's been so much so much junk that has gone on under the guise of the spirit filled church but Ruth oh Ruth oh Ruth hallelujah somebody say Ruth you gotta say Ruth oh Ruth <laughs> Ruth you're gonna have to wash yourself Ruth you're gonna have to anoint yourself baby don't be waiting around to get somebody else's anointing the anointing is in the Lord Jesus Christ he paid for it at Calvary it comes through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ I don't have to blow on you I don't have to spit on you I do believe in the gift of laying on of hands but this is for your service unto the Lord. It is only the anointing that is going to destroy the yoke. It's not going to be the showcase cinema. It is not going to be the accolades of men. It is not going to be all the other things that we've done. We've done them all. We've got the smoke machine. We've got the fog machine. we got this. we got that. we got everything you imagine. That stuff don't bother me. If I go to a youth conference and, and i got to have a flashlight to find my seat, and I, got, and, I, and I do, 
I do. I got to have a flashlight to find my seat because I'm old. I'm only 68, but these eyes are old. Yeah. I got to have a flashlight to get to my seat. And then when I get there, I'm, the fog is everywhere. Woo. Let me tell you something. Last year in February, at Wilmore, Kentucky, a little old hill jack town where the Asbury University was, as Methodist, Methodist, in that old chapel that was over 100 years old, right on top of the pipe organ, it said, Holiness under the Lord. They met to, in that chapel seats 2,000 just to have a, a normal chapel service that lasts 40 minutes. And the speaker got up and said, let's do something different. Is there anyone that would like to just say something from your heart? And a young man got up there and said, I do. I call myself a Christian. He said, I've been battling this. I drink. I do this. I sleep around. I smoke pot. He said, I am a hypocrite. And I want to apologize to my student body. And I want to apologize to God. But I'm telling you, fear fell on him. They started crying. They came up. I know you hear negative things, but this is the truth that when it started, they came up. Another one said, I want to test, I want to tell the same thing. They started praying. Chapel went from 40 minutes to an hour, from an hour to two hours, from two hours to 10 hours, from 10 hours to 20 hours, from 20 hours to 24 hours, from 24 hours to 36 hours. Oh, did they go home? No, it never stopped. I said it never stopped. The United Methodist Church. I'm not talking about Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Church of God. I'm not talking about United Pentecostal, Divided Pentecostal, Apostolic, whatever you want to call it yourself. I'm talking about United Methodist Church. It went one day, two day, three, 24 hours a day. We had young people in our church that would leave at 1 o'clock in the morning thinking that they could get a better look at the revival. But when they pulled up, there were 20,000 outside in the cold in the month of February with their hands raised. The young people didn't believe in speaking in tongues, but they were speaking in tongues. You're not going to hear that part. There was no fog machine. There was no charismatic leaders. There was no nothing. It wasn't nothing. It was as plain Jane as you can get. It was as simple as you could get. It defied everything that could be defied. God said, I'll have, but I'm going to tell you what, this is the great thing I want to tell you. In Cincinnati, we're only, we're just south of Cincinnati. In Cincinnati, Ohio, some of those young people that were at Asbury University, they went back to their home church that weekend and they said, Pastor, we've got a question. This is the largest one in Cincinnati, over 3,000. They said, Pastor, we want to know what side of the fence are we on. Are we the politically correct United Methodists or are we the Bible-believing United Methodists? Uh, which one are we? The pastor looked at that great congregation. He said, our students have come back from Asbury, and they've got a question. Which side of the fence are we on? He said, I want every one of you to come back at 6 o'clock tonight. He said, we're going to have a vote, and we're going to give these young people an answer. Are we going to be politically correct, or are we going to be a Bible United Methodist Church? Hallelujah. They took the vote that night. It was 95%. We're going to stay with the Bible. It spread like wildfire. It went over into East Cincinnati, West Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky. It started spreading everywhere that they were saying, we want to follow the will and the purpose of God. There are hungry hearts out there. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. And there's been so much wet wood that's laid around. Oh, but God's got a fire. I said, God. It's going to take the anointing of God. It's not going to be all of our programs. It's not going to be all of our messages. It's not going to be our fancy singing. It's not going to be our, our whatever else we have. It's going to be God, and God is going to do it all by himself. I said it's going to be God, and it's going to be God. Oh, Ruth. Oh, Ruth. Oh, 
almost sounds like Kentucky. <laughs> You're gonna have to wash yourself. You're not coming in this wedding with dirty feet. You're going to have to anoint yourself. Woo. <laughs> You're going to have to get it yourself. You're going to have to get the touch of God on your own life. You can't be shirt-tailing everybody else's religious experience. You can't be walking around and plugging in all the time. Got your cell phone getting somebody else's anointing. I believe in listening to the Word as much as you can listen to it. But there's only one source, and that source is the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the Christ that hung on the cross. It is God the Spirit that is in this place right now. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Lord, Ruth, oh Ruth, now that you've washed yourself, now that you've anointed yourself, and they come in that order too, now that you've washed yourself, now Ruth, oh Ruth, now that you've washed yourself and you've anointed yourself, you're going to have to put on your best garment. Isaiah chapter 61 is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 4. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to give recovery of sight to the blind. He has sent me, he has sent me to give to liberty them that are bruised. He, he, he said, and then it goes on, and when you get to verse 3, he said, I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. But in these last days, when the church is in the anointing, and the anointing is the only thing that's going to knock suicide out of, the, out of the person that needs it, it's the only thing going to fix this transgender stuff. I mean, you can talk, you can debate, you can have testimonies, but the only the anointing is the only thing that can fix it. It's only the anointing of somebody said, Preacher, you're awful sure about that anointing. You better believe it. I'm very sure about that anointing because everything that happened in that Bible, it happened because of a supernatural power that's bigger than human flesh, that's bigger than the human mind, that's greater than human intelligence, that is greater than any human thing that we got to offer. What? What we need, God, let there be an anointing fall on this house. <laughs> I'm going to point to you, and I want you to start clapping. Oh, don't clap till I point, and don't stop till I make it all the way around, because I want the enemy to know we've been, we're getting washed up. And we're going to get anointed up because there's one more thing we've got to do. we got to put on that garment of praise for the spirit of oppression, the spirit of depression. Start clapping. Just these. Now, you got to do it the Bible way. The Bible said clap your hands and shout.
will follow the ways of God. Now listen, you get yourself up, you have to get yourself down. He said, put on Ruth. Oh, Ruth. You're washed up. You're anointed up. Aren't you that Baptist preacher? Come here. Let's give God a praise for the Baptist. We say one word, praise, but in the Hebrew, it's a complete nut word. It has seven words. The first one's Barak. That's on your knees. You're lucky you get on your knees. Somebody said, I'm old. If I got down there, I might not get back up. I can. It's just a little tight sometimes. You don't have to be on your knees. It means humility. The second one is Zamar. Act like you're playing a bass. Oh, I want you to really play the bass. Come on, no, like this. Take that thumb. Mm, 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 mm. You got to shake your head to play the bass. Oh, yeah. Zamar. Say Zamar. Say Barak. That's worshiping God in humility. Zamar. That is worshiping with your music. Not just the music you play, but the music you listen to. You can't expect to get victory with God. You can't expect to get victory with God if you've got lust and problems like that and you get in your big old high-rise pickup truck. The wheels are jacked up so high you got to have a ladder to get in it. And you get in that pickup truck and all you can do is 45 minutes. you got that old that country on like that. And you're listening to wiggle, 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 wiggle. How do you ever expect to get free from lust when you listen to wiggle, wiggle every day to work? Oh, preacher, help me. I'm depressed. But every Monday, you and depression have coffee together. You turn on the oldies. You don't put on good gospel music. You put the oldies on. And you're sitting there going, <laughs> hanging around. Nothing to do but frown. Rainy days and Mondays always get me down. You think you're ever going to get victory? Oh, Brother Bates, pray. My home is falling apart. My home is falling apart. As soon as church is over, you get in your car and you click on your radio. D-I-V-O-R-C-E. You're not going to get any victory that way. You need some hand clapping, foot stomping, glory, hallelujah, shouting. You need some music that's going to drive the devil out, out, out in the name of Jesus. This word here is yada. That's lifting up the hands. This is what an athlete does in all cultures when he wins. Just run around there. Show him what a winner looks like. You got to put it on. I'm not going to hog tie you. I'm not going to dress you up with Barack, dress you up, dress you up with Zamar. You got to put it on yourself. This one is Toda. It's lifting up hands. You're lucky in the sanctuary and going. The Bible said in the sanctuary, and you're Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, a little bit more like Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give me some toad out 
terra. Aleluia! Come on! Aleluia! Aleluia! Oh, my dear brother, where are you from? Georgia. Georgia. Yes, you ought to be able to shabak like nobody else. A shabak is a loud, glorifying tone. It sounds like, whoa, except for better. Can you do it? Whoa! A little more. Whoa! Whoa! Then there's Tehillah. Tehillah is a song praise. It's where you go, he's my lily in the valley. Now, I come from Appalachian culture, and Appalachian culture is a cross between, it's all mixed up. It's Scottish Highlands mixed with African, mixed with Native American, and we got the chief of one of the tribes here. Woo! We got the chief here. So when we Tehillah praise, now in the Middle East it'd sound like this. Let me find myself first, Eric. In the Middle East it'd sound like, he's my rock, my fortress. I'm not from the Middle East. I'm from Appalachian culture. And with the mixture of the African and the Native American and the Scottish Highlands, it sounds like this. Believe me, I was raised on it. Oh, Lord, you're a rock in a weary land. Oh, you're the fairest of 10,000, oh, There's one more, brother. It's called Hallel. Hallel, the definition in, in the Hebrew translation, it means a foolish praise. Now, sometimes Hallel jumps up and down. And I've seen Hallel move on people and they shake their hands like this. In Kentucky, I've seen them have a Hallel power encounter and their shoulders go like that. Ah. Lord have mercy. I've seen them shake their head. I've seen them shout their hair down. I've seen them shout their hair off. All I know is it's a praise that you just can't explain. It's like sticking your finger in a light socket. Everybody's going to have a different expression. Do you hear me tonight? Well, I'm, I'm going to bring this message to a conclusion in just a moment. But before I do, you've got Barack, you've got Zamar, You've got to Yada, you've got Toda, you've got Shabbat, you've got Tehillah, hallelujah, and you've got Hallel. Time out. Time out. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to praise him. Now wait. Somebody said, listen, you're stretching me too far. 
I mean, the, the most I ever do is I, I love that, I love that Zamar. I go to a Bill Gaither concert and that's about it. That's as far as you're stretching me. And some would say, listen, my, my, uh, my Toda is only half mask right now. Yeah. I can get my hands up to my shoulder about it. That's as far as it's going. As far as that Shabak stuff, and as far as that Tehillah, and as far as that Hillel, you can count me out on all of it. But I want you to think about his goodness and what he's done for you. I'm going to give you only 10 seconds to give God either one of these praises or give him all seven. Are you ready? But I want to tell you something. There will be, there will be a last runner. There will be. The last runner I saw in the spirit. We're not going to get by easy. We're not going to have somebody with our cell phone over here, two people fanning us, somebody massaging our feet, somebody giving us water. I saw every runner. Every one of them, if you really press your way through in the realm of the Spirit, your feet will bleed. Your lips will get parched. The sun will bang and hit your forehead. The sunlight of, of trouble, it will come upon you. But one day, I'm going to keep on running. I don't know how long I get to run, but I'm going to keep on running. I'm going to keep on running. And when I'm old and gray-headed, forsake me not until I've shown this generation your strength and your power. I'm going to run until I see the archway. I'm going to run until I can hear music from another country. I'm going to run until I can see the waving of those that's gone on because there will be no sorrow there. No more burdens to bear. You're going to keep on running. No more sickness. No more pain. No more parting over there. And forever. I'm going to keep on running. I shall be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. Brother Swagger, if you want to join in with me, it's your church. Now don't you weep for me when I'm gone. Cause I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I won't have to leave here alone. Won't have to leave here alone. Are you all going with me? Let's do that again. Come on, this is participation night. Did you not know that? Hallelujah. Now don't you weep don't for you me weep. when I'm gone. When I'm gone. Cause I won't. For I won't have to leave here alone. Have to leave here alone. <laughs> and when, and when I hear that great, I hear that sound, trumpet sound, trumpet sound, my feet won't stand oh. here on the ground. 
It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Yes. It's gonna happen. Yes. And if you're not ready, if your sins are not under the blood, if you've come to this meeting, if you've come, first of all, you've never confessed Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior publicly. I want you to make your way to this altar. Secondly, if you came to resurrection camp meeting, and you were dry, dead. You need restoration, recovery, renewal, and reviving. I want you to move as quickly as you can and get down to here. I mean, come quickly. You in the balcony, and wherever you are, hallelujah. The Lord, there's going to be a multitude that's going to pray through to salvation right now. There's going to be a multitude. And many of you need to get renewed, revived, and recovered, and restored. Come on, don't you hold back. When upon the clouds of heaven, Christ shall come. Christ shall come. To earth again, to earth again. Will the world be glad to see him oh. when our Lord, oh, when our Lord shall come again? again. It's going to happen. There'll be singing, there'll be shouting, oh, there'll be song, oh, there'll be pain, there'll be weeping, and there'll be praying when our Lord. Again. I want you, brother, just sing Amazing Grace. It don't get any better than that for our invitational song tonight. Amazing Grace. 
Pastor Gabe, I want you to look at that audience that's around the world. There's many that need to be saved. Lead us in that prayer of salvation. I believe there's going to be hundreds, hundreds. You know what? I believe there's going to be thousands that are going to call on Jesus tonight. That's going to email however they correspond and tell us in this camp meeting I'm not going to I'm not going to be left behind Hallelujah. let's pray right now everyone in this audience just stretch forth your hands right now toward heaven those that are watching and listening do the same thing right now believe these words everyone in here is going to say it with you to give you strength now let's say it right now dear God in heaven, dear God in heaven I, come I come to you in the name of Jesus I'm sorry for my sins, the way I've lived, the things that I've done. Forgive me, wash me, cleanse me with your precious blood. Right now, I confess the Lord Jesus. With my mouth, I confess the Lord Jesus. In my heart, I believe God raised Jesus from the dead, and he is alive. And right now, at this moment, I can say, I'm washed, I'm cleansed, I'm forgiven, I am saved. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise here tonight. Praise God. These are my final words for everyone that's up here. It's your turn to run. It is your turn to run. The generations before you, they finished with blood on their feet, lips that were split, foreheads that were brow beaten and sunburned. It wasn't an easy price, but you're here. And you're making a commitment at Resurrection Camp Meeting. It's my time to run. Let's say these words, and then after the third one, we're going to give one wonderful, listen, I'm giving you seven words to praise. We're going to give God the best praise we can give him. Say, I'm washed. I'm anointed. I put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Now, if you believe that and it's your turn to run, I want you to give God the best praise you can give him.
Thank you, Pastor Tommy, for that word. I'm looking forward to it. Happy days are here again, church. Turn around, tell your neighbor you love them. Be back with us in the morning at 10 a.m. You don't want to miss it. We love you. God bless you. Well, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done. We hope you enjoyed this camp meeting service from the Sunlight Broadcasting Network. 